Hello and welcome. I am Matt Roddy and this is the Greater Prescott Podcast where we talk about, you guessed it, all things Greater Prescott. I am super excited because first off, Tracy is my guinea pig because this is my first ever podcast. So Tracy, thank you very much for being the guinea pig. Thanks for having me. Tracy is the owner of Black Butterfly Artisan Chocolate here in the Old Firehouse Plaza in downtown Prescott. Tracy, again, thank you very much for your time and being willing to be on the podcast. Appreciate it. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> I'm also doing great. Good. I met you about a year, year and a half ago when I was doing real estate and I, we did a video about Black Butterfly. And right. one of the things I remember, we did a short video and we were hardly able to get into much of anything. And so I'm super excited about this format so that the people can get to know who you are and just more things about you, why you do what you do and excellent things more about Greater Prescott. Good. So in order to jump right into it, give the listeners an, an idea of a little bit of your childhood as well as some of your previous, I know you haven't always done this for a career. And so right. give us five minutes of a background and how you ended up in Greater Prescott. Okay. Well, I'm originally from Northern Ontario, Canada. I grew up in a small town, population 400. Everybody knew everybody. We used to find out all the town gossip listening in on the party line. That's how old I am. Mm. And then I moved when I was 18 to the West Coast to Vancouver, British Columbia, which is quite a melting pot of cultures. From there, I moved to the U.S. in 1997 to Las Vegas, Nevada, of all places. <laughs> And I didn't come from a culinary background when I was in Canada, as well as part of my time in Las Vegas. I worked for a telephone company for 20 years. Oh, wow. I was a circuit design engineer. And when the company that I worked for in Las Vegas went bankrupt and we lost absolutely everything, our 401ks, our shares, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, at that time, then went to work for the state of Nevada for the Department of Motor Vehicles, and I was a drive examiner for eight years. So <laughs> you've, you've, you're brave. No wonder you're my guinea pig. <laughs> yeah. And uh, upon leaving Las Vegas, I relocated to Naples, Florida. And at that time, I had come to the decision that I didn't want to work in the corporate field anymore. I had played with chocolate briefly in Canada and then a friend had introduced me to Venezuelan chocolate when I was in Las Vegas. And as a supplement to my income, because when I got downsized, mm -hmm. when the company went bankrupt and I started working for the Department of Motor Vehicles, my income was cut drastically. So to supplement my income, I started doing some of the chocolates again. Mm -hmm. And once I was introduced to the Venezuelan chocolate, there was just no comparison with anything else. And so going to Florida, not wanting to go back into the corporate world, I decided, well, I like playing in chocolate, so why not give it a shot? So I just... Go ahead and fix them. Yeah, just yeah they're, they're sliding don't on Don't hesitate. Me. Um, so I ended up starting a chocolate company there, and I didn't have a brick-and-mortar store. I rented commercial kitchen space, and I did high-end farmer's markets up and down the Gulf Coast, as well as catering events, and then I wholesaled to a couple of different companies as well. At that time, I called the company Once Upon a Bean, okay. and it confused people. The first question out of a customer's mouth all the time was, what kind of coffee yeah. do you have? not realizing that chocolate also comes from a bean. Mm -hmm. So in relocating to Arizona, I decided to rebrand the business. Okay. And that's where Black Butterfly 
came in. Gotcha. It, what is the significance to the name? The significance to Black Butterfly was, number one, in relocating here, I was coming off of a divorce. The butterfly is a form of rebirth, metamorphosis. And the black butterfly itself is extremely unique. And I thought what I was bringing to the Prescott area was unique. As well, there's a song by Denise Williams, a black artist, called Black Butterfly, and it talks about how this is your time to shine and that dreams really do come true, and it's a time to show people how unique and beautiful you are. And the words just kind of spoke to me, and that's the name. Here you are. Here I am. So how do you get from Canada to Vegas to (laughs) the coast of Florida (laughs) and then to Little Ole? Greater Prescott. Well, uh, let's say men had a part in it. (laughs) Um, I initially had wanted to um, immigrate to the U.S. My grandfather was an American. Oh, okay. He was born in Brimley, Michigan. And I had always had a fascination with the U.S. You know, it was the land of opportunity, the where everyone could have the house, the white picket fence, the two cars, 2.3 kids, you know. Um, And it was always an attraction. We always vacationed in the U.S. because the shopping was better, the climate was better, you know. So it was always a dream. Um, Did I see myself going to Vegas initially? No. I had an uncle that lived there. Um, I wanted to initially go to Santa Barbara. A little different. (laughs) A little different. Yeah. Um, But as I said, a man was involved. (laughs) And so I ended up in Vegas. Um, Vegas is a nice place to visit, to vacation. But so far as living there, uh, though the temperature is very hot, the people are very cold. You either, at least in my experience, I found you either grew up there and you had your core group of family and friends, or you came there with your core group. And no one seems to venture outside of that. You know, no, we didn't all live in hotels. We didn't all work party every weekend on the strip. Yeah. I rarely, rarely would go to the strip unless I had family or friends come to visit. And then I would play tour guide. But otherwise, no. It's a very cold city, you know, people wise. So, and then, of course, I relocated again to Naples, Florida, again, because of a man. (laughs) <laughs> and he always wanted to live on the water, which I found very appealing, again, because living in Vancouver, I was used to being on the ocean. I was used to being able to go down to the boats at the docks and buy my fresh seafood right off the boat. So yeah. being in Florida was ideal. Now, he initially wanted to be over in Fort Lauderdale, and I went and we had a look. I found Fort Lauderdale to be very dirty. Um, the beaches weren't as nice. So I said, you know, I've been reading a lot about Naples. I really would like to see the Gulf of Florida. So we drove across one, I think it was a Thanksgiving weekend. And I said, just keep an open mind. That, that's all I'm asking. And have a look. And so we went across and absolutely fell in love turquoise water white powdery sand that's what Uh, the pictures show oh it and it's everything the pictures show and the money that is spent on landscaping uh, the beautiful green and floral baskets and everything just absolutely breathtaking and we started going around to the local farmers markets there and they are like nothing you have ever seen before 
the food that is available at some of these markets. And a lot of the vendors come from the east, northeast. Oh, exactly. And they come down, they spend the winters and work through the winter mm. doing the markets, and then they all head north and they do the summer the markets thing. up in the Carolinas and New yeah, York north, and yep. whatnot. So it was really fascinating. Yeah. And I knew after seeing them, I just wanted to be a part of it. It's a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. and you work really, really hard for six months, and then that's it. Oh. And you might as well roll up the sidewalks the other six months in Florida because everybody leaves, and it's dead. And it pours rain, and the thunder, and the hurricane season starts. So summer's not so pleasant. Winter's yep. absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really, really liked it. Mm -hmm. Don't miss the bugs. Don't miss no, the humidity. It's, it's humid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very. So, so you end up in Prescott. Yes. How many years have you been here? We'll have had the store open three years on the 14th of this month. Oh, wow. That'd be June 14th, 2020. Right. But I've actually had the commercial space for three years and eight months. Okay. It took us eight months to get open. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but um, it was three years living here myself because construction started before I moved. And I celebrated three years in march of this year well congratulations of living here congratulations yeah one of the reasons that i love these conversations is because what i just learned about your backstory is fascinating and yeah. i just find so many people we we all have a story right and so it's fun to hear your story uh, just how unique it is and how it has brought you to where you are Right. I, I love that. So now that we're you're here in Prescott, we're here at Black Butterfly. If you don't know what Black Butterfly is, Tracy is going to explain. Tell everyone about your business. Okay. Well, Black Butterfly is an artisan chocolate company. And I founded it, like I said, I started in Florida as Once Upon a Bean. I am unique in that I only use single origin Venezuelan chocolate. It's fair trade and grown without pesticides. I don't use any other chocolate. Venezuela has always been known as the king of cacao. It is one of the few countries that the chocolate is grown and produced in the same country. Because when you look at places like Switzerland or Belgium, for Belgium or Swiss chocolate or French chocolate, it's not growing there. Cacao, ideally, the best growing conditions is either 20 degrees, either north or south of the equator. So what makes it Belgium chocolate or Swiss chocolate is the way they process the bean. So... Yeah. And single origin means we use one bean, one region. Whereas some companies will use a blend of beans mm -hmm. from different regions. Yeah. And your bean is going to take on flavors of the terrain. So yeah. if it's growing, say, close to bananas, it's going to take on a banana flavor. Really? Or tobacco. Wow. It will take on a tobacco flavor. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, like I said, we use single origin only. And the bean that we use is one of the premier beans. There are three different levels for the most part of beans. There are the Forestero beans, the Trinitario, and the Criollo. Okay. And what we use, you're comparing basically Walmart to Neiman Marcus. Okay. That, that's the easiest way to explain it. What some companies will do is they'll take the lowest grade bean, the Forestero bean, and they'll use the majority of their blend of that, and then they'll throw in a little bit of the Criollo or the Trinitario in. and create a blend. It's cheaper for them. Of course. 
but ideally is the flavor going to be as great? What I like about the Venezuelan chocolate is it's multifaceted. It's going to evolve on your palate in, and into several different layers of flavor as it dissolves. So, so with that chocolate, mm-hmm. what do you make? I do chocolate barks, chocolate bars. We call them mendiant bars because okay. there are inclusions on top. We do little mendiant discs. We do bonbons, which for the most part, a lot of bonbons are ganache centered like a truffle. But they don't have to be. The difference between a truffle and a bonbon is a truffle is usually a hand-rolled item. A bonbon is a shelled item that can be filled with a ganache like a truffle or a caramel or a marzipan or a patafui or a fondant or buttercream. So that's the difference. Um, All of our bonbons are hand-painted by me. They're painted with cacao butter. So when they press the bean, the fat that's extracted from the bean is the cacao butter. And they color it with food grade dyes. And then we temper it the same as we do chocolate. Because that's the actual part of chocolate that requires tempering. Tempering meaning we take it to a certain temperature, we drop it down again, and then bring it back up to a working temperature. And that creates the high gloss and the snap. Because if you don't temper, if you were to make a chocolate bar that wasn't tempered, you would quite possibly get streaks through it. But sitting it on the table within half hour, it's going to start to go soft. It's not going to hold that firmness. Okay. The bonbons that I do, uh, like I said, they are all hand painted. It's a four day process to make them. If you guys, and I can put some photos up as we're talking, these are a piece of art. Thank you. And as I think about what you do here, you're an artist. Thank you. And if you guys, it may may be hard to think of a Hershey chocolate bar, that someone who makes those and (laughs) and thinks that they're, that that's art. That's not art. No. No. That's a commodity. Yeah. What we have behind us next to us is is our work. And so I'm fascinated by the beauty of them. Thank you. Great work. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Well, artisan, you know, one of the actual definitions of artisan is small batch. Okay. So the largest batch size I do is four pounds at a time, whereas mass producers are doing hundreds of pounds Mm -hmm. at a time. So it's very different. If you guys have not come into the shop, the photos will not do justice. So please come in and at the very least enjoy. Yeah. It's, it's uh, it's kind of like a chocolate museum or museum (laughs) for chocolate. If you want to put it that way, just, it's really beautiful stuff. No. One of my favorite things is not just that you are an artist, but it is, why do you do what you do? It's it's a it's a challenging question to answer, and it's also challenging for me. Making chocolate, a lot of people can do that. You do something much different. It's on a different level, and so right. where did where does it come from? Well, you know, it, it is a difficult question to answer because I never ever saw myself working in the food industry you know, not having a culinary background. It was the furthest thing from my mind. What I initially had wanted to do was be an interior designer. And when I was 40, I went back to school for interior design. But then life happened and nothing came to fruition. I I got a, a portion of my degree. I got residential planning and everything. But there was always that aspect of color and design, uh, that sensibility really appealed to me. I am far more a right brain person than I am a left. And I wanted to have a job that didn't feel like a job. I, I wanted to get up in the morning and not regret having to 
go to work. You know, I wanted to enjoy and have a sense of pride in what I was doing. And I love food. Always have. Me too. Yeah. And a lot of my flavor profiles come from the 21 years in Vancouver because Vancouver is very much a melting pot of cultures. And so I draw on a lot of that. So we do a lot of East Indian flavors. We do a lot of um, Hispanic or Asian type flavors. So, and just different flavors. I, I came to the philosophy when I was in Florida. I used to have a lot of people ask me for certain things, uh, chocolate wise, and I would make them and they would never sell. And so I then developed the attitude that I'm going to give you what you don't know you want. And from that time on, sales have been great because people are curious by nature and they want to try different things. And it always excites me when they go, well, I, I don't know about that. And I'll give them a sample and then they go, wow. That, that really works, yeah. you know. So there, there was that aspect that I, I really wanted to delve into introducing people to different types of foods. On that note, here in the counter, let's quickly go over some of these flavors because there's a couple that you'll recognize, but the pairings are what it... That's what's really unique. Right. So just kind of quickly go through and let people know some of these flavor profiles that you have put together because you hit the nail on the head. Right. Customers don't really know what they want in, in a sense. And especially they don't have the creativity to think of what they might actually want. And that sounds like that's where you've gone. Right. And like I said, I'm one for introducing a lot of savory or what you would consider savory into the chocolate as well. For instance, we'll start at the bottom with some of our barks. Uh, Do a pistachio with rose petals, cardamom, and fleur de sal. Now, roses and cardamom, which is a Middle Eastern spice, are quite common in Middle Eastern cooking. So if you've ever heard of like Turkish delight, that's Mm -hmm. got roses Mm -hmm. in it. And it's usually mixed with pistachios as well. And it's, you know, cardamom is one of those flavors that you quite often find in savory cooking. You know, although there are some that make cardamom cookies. Mm. But for the most part, it's not a flavor that's found as a rule in sweet. And salt is just a natural pairing with chocolate. Mm. Salt makes everything dance. Amen. Yeah. Mm. Whether it be caramel or chocolate, it it just brightens everything up. Um, What about a mendant? Mendiant. Mendiant. Now, the mendiants, my favorite on that row is fig and pink peppercorn. Now, black mission figs are just extraordinary. And pink peppercorns lend themselves more to a fruity note than they do a spicy note. And they pair beautifully with the black mission figs. I hope you guys are getting this. You would have... I would have never walked in here and thought, man, today I I am getting a fig and pink peppercorn unless I saw it. Right. And even at that, how you talk about the flavor profiles, is it's fascinating. I'm, I enjoy talking, and I know nothing much about coffee, but it has some similar similarities right. with respect to some of the yeah. flavors. You've, you're able to take it to a completely different level because you can bring in yeah. a lot of things. Well, and coffee, very similar to cacao, is that it picks up the flavor notes of the terrain that it's growing in. Yes. Yeah. And I, I didn't realize that until you said it. And because I've been thinking of coffee the whole time going, oh, man, that's probably very similar. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Now, bonbon-wise, my latest obsession is lemon basil. It is a tart lemon gel that sits on top of a basil ganache. And that's in our white chocolate. Yeah. yeah. And basil, you know, most people are quite familiar with. Absolutely. And if you have some pasta dishes, a lot of times you may have a basil pesto with a little uh, lemon zest. Mm -hmm. So yeah. why, not why not pair them together with chocolate? I love it. Yeah. At the top left, and yep. you probably have lots of, well, they're all unique in a sense, but just kind of tell everyone about the top left. The... PB&J. Mm -hmm. The PB&J is our take on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So it's a strawberry patafouille, which a patafouille is basically a, a firm gel, but we make this one pipeable. So we take fruit puree made of the strawberries and add a pectin to gel it up, and then we pipe that in, and then a peanut butter ganache sits below it. So you see what I'm talking about, you guys? <laughs> yeah. So it's probably one of the most common flavors that I do. Okay. Uh, because, uh, like I said, our other peanut butter one in the case is our peanut butter sizzle, which is a peanut butter ganache that has a little cayenne finish. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And why not? Do you not get peanut butter that's spicy in Thai food? Your dipping sauces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's, that's why I love this. That, that, and that's why I consider you an artist. Uh, you just, Thanks. you just, you get to wake up and go, you know what? I think this flavor and that flavor should be put together. You, us listeners, we would have never, ever, ever thought about it. Yeah. So I just love it. Yeah. Our funnest collection was just recently for Mother's Day, we did a fresh from the herb garden and every flavor was paired with herbs. So we did a rosemary lemon. We did the lemon basil. We did a blueberry and thyme. We did a strawberry and mint and we did a blackberry and sage. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, One of the things I also really enjoy about what you do and you talked about it earlier, small batches. Mm -hmm. With the small batches, it gives you a lot of, obviously, flexibility because you're making it and you're putting it in and then it's going out. Right. How often are you turning over flavors? Constantly. Yeah. yeah. As the mood strikes, basically. <laughs> I would, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Normally, I would have 12 bonbon flavors in the case at all time but um, because of the pandemic we didn't have a lot of backup because there weren't a lot of people around most of my recipes are geared to last two to three months okay but ideally you know we like everyone to consume them within 14 days yes. you know because we have no idea what storage conditions mm -hmm. they're going to be in so we recommend that you consume them within 14 days Makes sense. but um, because of the pandemic I wasn't creating a lot because I didn't want a lot of waste so now I'm trying to Getting pay back into catch it. up so come this weekend we've got uh, three brand new flavors going in the case mm -hmm. that we've not had before right. so give us a sneak peek what it What's yeah. upcoming? We've got a... By the time this airs, right. these will be in the case. Yes. Yeah. We've got a yuzu caramel. Yuzu is a Japanese citrus. It's a cross between a mandarin orange and a lemon. And so we've made a, a beautiful, luxurious liquid caramel yeah. out of that. And it's going to be in a dark chocolate shell. Then... I normally do a passion fruit, but in the past, I've always done our passion fruit ganache in a combination of dark and milk chocolate. We've got one that we're referring to as toucan because of the bright colors that I've painted it. And it's going to be passion fruit in our white chocolate this okay. time. And so it's going to be quite tart. And then also, what else did I have on the go? <laughs> I'm trying to blank all of this. Oh, I know. Blueberry cheesecake. Oh, yummy. So it's a blueberry patafouille 
on top of a cheesecake ganache. I love all the words. Yeah. It's a whole different and language. And th- this one we're excited about because I painted it based on a shirt at the women's clothing shop across the way. Yeah. So that was the inspiration for the paint job of it. That's so fun. Yeah. All right. So those three will be in the case. There's what Tracy does in, and why you do it. Mm-hmm. I, it's just so much fun. So you could literally come in here... Once a month, which she'll happily have you in more often. (laughs) But with once a month, you're going to get an entirely new turnover of... Right. Maybe not entirely, but you're always going to be able to find something new. Yeah. There's there's a couple of flavors that, you know, we usually have on a pretty regular basis. But just in the bonbons alone, I think I'm at about 100 different flavors now. Wow. Yeah. That's great. So, lots of fun. Let's talk Greater Prescott. All right. I love Greater Prescott. So do I. I think you do too. Tell the listeners what it is about this area that you enjoy so much. All right. Well, initially when I was looking to set up shop, I never really saw myself here. I was looking in Phoenix, Fountain Hills, Carefree Mm -hmm. area, but... To be frank, once I got in that traffic, I decided no. I had been to Prescott before when I lived in Las Vegas, and we had come here to go antiquing. And I absolutely fell in love with it. I liked the small town, Mm -hmm. Main Street, USA type atmosphere that it gave. I didn't realize that I would once again be living in a place that had all four seasons. Mm -hmm. Because when I had been here before, it had been in the summer. Mm -hmm. A lot of my friends laugh because they said, well, we could understand you moving to Arizona, but we thought you'd pick the hot part of Arizona. (laughs) And I had always known Flagstaff got snow. I never imagined Prescott got snow. But what I really liked, like I said, is that downtown Main Street USA type feel. I also liked the fact that there was something going on all the time. But more than that, come Christmas, I thought it was so fascinating to see a city that still had their belief system in place to come to a place that drew thousands of people to hear the story of Jesus and his birth was just absolutely amazing to me. And it just moved me so much. And then also the fact that it gives you a real sense of community. I I have often said to my mom, It's the first place that I have ever lived by myself, not knowing anyone here, yet I've never felt alone because it does have such a sense of community. Mm -hmm. And that became extremely evident during this pandemic when all of the townspeople rallied around the small business owners Mm -hmm. to help them out. You know, whether the restaurants were only open for takeout, they were constantly on social media. What's this restaurant's menu? Who's doing takeout? Who's doing this? They were just there in full support with their pocketbooks open Mm -hmm. to try and keep this community alive. And that's what's attracted me to this space. It is still got its conservative values Mm -hmm. intact you know people uh, you know I even though I came from a small town initially like I said population 400 Mm -hmm. um, I for most of my adult life have lived in metropolitan cities Vancouver Vegas yeah very fast-paced No one says hello. Here you walk down the street. Doesn't matter whether or not they know you. They say good morning. 
you know, that's unheard of, you know, in the cities that I've lived in in the past. I could not agree more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is, it's just incredible, Uh, you know, and it's amazing how many people it attracts because of that, you know, and I try and really put forth that same sort of attitude when people come in the store uh, if you've been in more than once, I usually know your name. Right. And I call you by name because I want you to feel as at home in my store as I do. Yeah. Because it's a part of your community. I just want to piggyback on that because I was born and raised in Tucson where I lived till I graduated high school. Then I moved to Phoenix which I was there for 16 or 17 years. And then I moved here. And so my experience in Phoenix was largely the same as your experience in Las Vegas. Right. It's a transient city. Nothing bad about that. It just is what it is. And the first time I stepped foot in Prescott, I quote, this place actually exists. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard. It, we are really, yeah. we're somewhat isolated in a sense. I mean, and that's part of what makes it great. Kind of like Pleasantville. A uh, kind of. Yeah. It really it really has some of those characteristics that yeah. like you said there is an activity going on all the time. And yeah. granted we had 2 months of covid. Right. But things are getting back into it and that's one of the, that's probably one of the top 3 reasons we my family and I moved here. Yeah. Because of the activities. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about all the outdoor stuff, but there, there's just a lot yeah. to do here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I never get to enjoy any of them, but. <laughs> <laughs> you do work very hard back here. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we, we try like I, you know, for the lighting of the courthouse yeah. and the Christmas story, I'll usually close up shop early to attend that. Mm-hmm. I wish I would have been able to attend Acker night prior to opening um, mm. but never had the opportunity to do that and now that the store has been open three years we have participated in Acker Night okay. every single year yeah and it's absolutely phenomenal for those listening explain give the two sentence version of what Acker Night is because it is a very special time right yeah Acker Night is a fundraiser basically for scholarship programs um, for students and for musical instruments. And musicians give of their time free of charge. Businesses pay to participate and and they can choose to either have a musician in-house or not. And their money, again, goes to scholarships. Any tip money to the musician goes to the scholarships as well. And they bus people in by the thousands again. And it's not unheard of to have 4,000 people roaming the downtown streets of Prescott to all of the participating businesses and listening to absolutely phenomenal music at each location that they go to. We have a very musical town. Yes. You wouldn't if you just visited for a weekend, you wouldn't quite be tipped off towards it. But it's events like Acker Night that you realize, wow, right. we have a lot of musicians. And yeah. Acker Night is, is really one of the highlights of our entire year where exactly. shops open. I mean, shops open up and it, most of the time, especially by the time my family, my wife and my kids and I get, make it downtown, y- y- the shops are already full. Yeah, they're full. You you can't even get in. It's just and they they close down all downtown. So you're just free to walk. And it's it's like you've been transported to a different place. It's fantastic. Yeah, we Mm. monitor it because our shop is so small. And once you get a musician in here as well, which we usually get a jazz musician because that's what we normally play in the store is soft jazz. Um but we usually have someone man the door. The first two years that I did it, one of my customers dressed up in her father's 1930s tuxedo, complete with top hat and white gloves, and she would only let about a dozen people in at a time. Last year, we had the opportunity 
to have the lead from the Yavapai College Phantom of the Opera, and he was dressed in full costume. Wow. And he manned the door, and some of his castmates came down and they broke into song outside mm-hmm. our mm-hmm. shop, which was just incredible. Yeah. He, he was a very, very extreme talent, yeah. you know, for such a small town. And that's what makes the greater Prescott area yeah. amazing. Yeah. It really is amazing. Yeah. If you haven't participated in Akronite, you, you absolutely have to. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. The other event that we do twice a year actually is in conjunction with Whiskers Barkery and the Yavapaa County uh, Rescue dog uh, search and rescue Mm -hmm. dogs and we do their easter egg hunt and we do their trick-or-treat where the dogs go around to participating Mm -hmm. local businesses and yeah they get their treats it's really quite comical to see especially the halloween costume one where they all come in their costumes and yeah so halloween's another great event yeah around here yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so we enjoy doing that Yeah. See what you guys learn when <laughs> you listen to the podcast. <laughs> All, I mean, just, yeah, what makes you special? What makes the greater Prescott area special? And, and right. again, what I love about this area, and it, it reigns true every time I meet people and develop relationships, that it's, yes, we have an amazing area. It's the people that make it this way. Yes. It's just, it, there's... It's hard to put into words yeah. what it is. And it's places like Black Cho- black Butterfly Artists and Chocolate that m- and you that make All our right. area such a neat place. Thanks. Before we wrap it up, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you some questions in rapid fire <laughs> type. <laughs> okay. And so just give your best answer. Okay. No pressure. All right. Here we go. <laughs> What's your favorite thing about Greater Prescott? The people. Favorite restaurant in Greater Prescott? El Gato Azul. What's the number one thing on your Greater Prescott bucket list? Oh, gee, that's hard. Well, I want to, uh, and this is not rapid fire, I want to collaborate with some of the local artists and have their artwork be part of a chocolate bar wrapper. I love it. (laughs) What's your favorite, what's your all-time favorite bonbon? (laughs) Oh, <laughs> well, at the moment, lemon basil. Okay. It's right here. Yeah. What are a couple words to describe living in Greater Prescott? Beauty. Friendliness. Sense of community. That's perfect. <laughs> And that's actually, I was going to ask a couple more questions. There's no need to do it. That is such a fantastic ending because that's what we do love about the greater Prescott area. Thanks. Tracy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity, Matt. Real quickly, tell everyone where you are and how they can connect and eat some amazing artisan chocolate. Okay. I'm in downtown Prescott, half block off the square in the old firehouse plaza. For any of the locals, you should know it because half of the firehouse plaza was the original firehouse. (laughs) So it's between Whiskey Row and Granite on Goodwin Street. Fantastic. You guys, please come support Tracy, support Greater Prescott in general, and we really appreciate you hanging out with us for today. We hope you learned something new, learned something of value, and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye. Great.